Okay, so I've already prayed. So starting with the stand up. All right, so all right, there it is. Um, I'm going to put this up here so that you're in a screen sharing the video. Okay, so here we are still in the breaking cycle. Uh, continue announcements. We're still in the book of John. We haven't picked the next book that we're doing yet. We're in the process of figuring that out. Leadership team, you know, submit your ideas so that uh, I kind of have a couple ideas um, where I where maybe we can go. But if if I don't hear from anyone, I'll just pick one of them. We are moving to the fifth cycle, which is sexual sin. Um, I had it as uh, passion, perversion, and lust. So if you look on the prior slides, that's what this was labeled under passion, perversion, and lust. But as I began to study, I just, it became easier to find scripture that's consistent uh, and finding patterns of cycles uh, when I looked at sexual sin, so I could find out what the actual cycle was. And so that's why I changed the name. But there are cycles with, as it relates with the sexual sin, but there is anything else. And again, for review, for those that are new to this series, um, these are the cycles that we, we talk about. The, the bottom cycle here is the death cycle. We do this the first week and then we do the breakthrough. And then the second week, we talk about faith, uh, the, the faith cycle or the life cycle, seeking to give you discipline so that you know how to break out of the cycle. And the reason why I wanted to share is because uh, people have told me the application that they have been able to do with the teaching to help in various areas of their life by listening to the to the cycle um, series. And so that's been kind of uh, encouraging that people are finding practical applications for these cycles to help them in their everyday lives. Um, these are the stronghold cycles. If you don't know what strongholds are, you have godly and ungodly strongholds. The godly strongholds on the outside are the white, and the inside are the black, the darker ones, which are the ungodly ones. But it still has the same cycle for strongholds. It's about your belief system, what you do, and your reward. Um, and when we talk about the breakout, we can break out, we can break through, or we can be broke down. If you're in the death cycle, most likely you're breaking down, you have issues, problems, and it's just keep keep you in a cycle and you don't know how to get out. So this is a question for everyone. What is your definition of sexual sin? If you were had to describe it, what label or what how how does that look to you? Anybody? You were sleeping around. Sleeping around. Okay. Anyone else? Perversion. Perversion. What? What? What exactly does that mean? Like lust or something like that. Lust. Okay. Anyone else? Mm, sexual feeling or desire gets you off track from your goals. What you're trying to accomplish. Any sexual thoughts and feelings that's getting you off of your goals. Okay. Wait, wait. Um, uh, like sex outside of marriage or um, infidelity or adultery or um, what was the other one I was just thinking of? Um, like masturbation, mm -hmm. fantasy, that type of thing. Okay. Okay. What is it? Porno, sexual, porno. Porn. Porn. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> Pauline called porn. Oh no. Oh no. 
We don't want no oh no around here. I got to tell Daryl that one. Yeah. <laughs> So there we're talking about oh no, he can help the scholars down there in the desert. <laughs> Even rain glasses. Yeah. So if you think about sexual sin, it's really things that people struggle with. It's mm -hmm. it's the things that you've said and moved before. Um, so I put this kind of slide up to talk about sexual sin in a lot of different ways. One of the things that we really don't think about sexual sin is as it relates to witchcraft. Mm -hmm. um, there are love potions that are out there that people make up potions and trinkets mm -hmm. to get people to fall in love with them, to do things that they would never usually do. And if you think that this isn't real, it is very real. I had a person that was bewitched and trying to get that cycle broken off of them was very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the other one uh, that we don't think about are bedroom demons. Things that happen at night, you see demons, you feel like you're being touched at night, mm -hmm. you can't breathe. Is uh, that the incubus and succubus, right? You have incubus succubus. and succubus spirits, but you also have other night spirits that come mm -hmm. in to harass you, to torment you, give you nightmares yeah. of people, places, and things that you you don't want to have, and they just kind of visit you in your bedroom. Um, that's another way of the sexual mm -hmm. gets an enter, and uh, of course, all of these things here, and your emotion, mm -hmm. lust, pleasure, and all those things. Mm -hmm. Even through abuse, um, huh? I was thinking about the spirits who come to rape me at night. Right. 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 Um, he was just talking about the same thing Wendy did, the, the, the incubus and succubus spirits. Um, when you think about rape or this child abuse, 90% um, of children that are abused know their abuser. And of the 90%, only 60% tell anyone. So you can imagine how much hurt and pain is out there where you have a child that sees this uncle, sees this nephew, sees this cousin on a regular basis. And every time they see him, it means trauma, but they can't do anything about it. And they're just shut up in the silence. Mm -hmm. A lot of times mm -hmm. sexual sin confuses love with lust. We have to know the difference between the two. You know, we say it, we fell in love at first sight. We actually fell in lust at first sight, right? Um, <laughs> that's generally what happens at first sight. Um, so sexual sin, as I said, we talk about passion. Passion is a strong emotion when used wrongly brings dishonor and shame. That's what I want you to remember that word, dishonor. This honor is going to be a really important key as I was studying this. When you think about sexual sin, do you think sexual sin, you know what? Did I stop recording? Yeah. When you think about sexual sin, I think I'm recording. Um, do you think it has to do with sex or something else? When I think of what, what was the question? I didn't hear part of it. When you think about sexual sin, uh -huh. is it about sex or is it about something else? In your opinion. Mm -hmm. Sex, they're saying in the room. Which, what about online? No, I don't think it is. Um, I think it's about a, a void. I think it's about emptiness. I think it's some all that. You think it's about void, you think it's about emptiness. What did you say, Amanda? I feel like it's dependent on what you consider to be sex. Like everybody has a different idea of what sex is like. Some people think that masturbation is a form of sex. I agree with that, but I guess it just depends upon what you think. Okay. Okay. So if you didn't hear, she said it people have a lot of different opinions on what sex is. Some people 
think that masturbation, specifically, she doesn't think masturbation is a form of sex, right? As she said. Um, and so the definition of sex has a lot of different meanings. And so it's kind of, what did you say? It's kind of hard to define. It's, so it's kind of hard to find what that actually means. I think something like that is was the bottom line of her statement. And so uh, we will look at that and see what the scripture says about, about sexual sin. Um, but remember, just remember this fact. When you see the fruit, there's something else that's causing the root. So if you're caught in sexual sin and you can see the sin, you can see whatever you want to call it, if you masturbation, if you don't look at whatever you think that definition is, you can see that. That's always a fruit. And we all know that if you see the fruit, there has to be another root that's making that fruit grow. So that's always going to be a determination for you is if you're caught in sexual sin, why am I caught in this sin? What's actually really going on underneath the root of this act activity and action? Okay, so when we have passion, you can have good passion. Passion of Christ is a good one. But we're talking about a strong emotion when wrong, what used wrongly brings dishonor and shame. And many times, um, for example, we can use the thing of masturbation some person will masturbate, not feel any shame or guilt or dishonor because they think it's okay. The another person will masturbate and they're under condemnation and, and conviction and feel shame and, and think they're the lowest thing since, since sliced bread. And it really depends on your what you're considering truth because truth is going to make you feel guilty or not, make you feel convicted or not. And your truth is what's going to dictate your moral look at any sexual activity that you're, that you're doing. Um, so remember, passion. The other one was perversion. Perversion, a lot of people think it has to do with sexuality. But perversion actually has to do with confusion. It has to do with violating the natural divine order of something. So when people talk about same-sex marriage, that has nothing to do with passion, but it does have something to do with perversion because it causes confusion. It causes a violation of God's, of the divine order of God. Now they may say uh, it's a natural thing for them. Girls with girls, guys with guys, getting your gender changed and all that. Um, but again, what is the baseline for making that assessment it's what truth is and since everyone has a form of truth that's what makes this question of passion perversion sexual sin such a large topic because everyone uses a different standard we as christians should be using the one standard which is the word of god and every act and action and thought that we do should be filtered through that scripture but we don't necessarily do that. So this is lust and love. This is the third thing we were talking about sexual sin, passion, perversion, and lust. Usually this is an intense, unbridled sexual desire. It has. It can also do with power and it can also do with greed. So lust is not always sexual. People can lust after power, prestige, food, money, gambling. There's a host of things you can lust after. But as, as we're talking about this, I thought that this picture was really explaining what lust is about. It's really about seeking pleasure of some sort. Even if the pleasure is power, you are getting, you're getting a, some self-satisfaction from this power. Um, if you think about power over someone, um, if you think about... Um, um, when you when you think about lust, you think about the things that you see, the things that you do. Lust has a whole different feeling than love. You can look at someone with loving eyes and they can be looking back with you at lust. 
And because of your mind thinking that they're looking back at you with the same desires that you're having because you love this person, all they're seeing is you as a person to satisfy their lust. That's why you have to really have discernment, not only over your feelings, but over that person, because love and lust can look a lot alike. Love can send flowers, but so can lust. Love can take you to dinner, so can lust. Uh, love can say, I love you, but so can lust, you know? So you really have to learn discernment what love is. Love is a gift that you have to grasp versus lust trying to get their hands around you. So when you talk about sexual sin, these are the three areas which are very large, granted, that we're talking about. So it says here that sexual sin can be defined as any attitude or behavior that deviates, let's move this out the way, no matter where I put it, it'll be in the way, that deviates from God's, huh? <laughs> from God's original design for human sexuality. Now that was probably the most simplest term in a sentence, because Amanda says I have too much work on this sheet, but that's a, a succinct sentence. What is sexual sin? Any attitude or behavior that deviates from God's original design for human sexuality. So then the search becomes, what did he design human sexuality to look like? Well, if you answer that question and you know that answer, everything else is sexual sin. This includes the acts, the thoughts, the desires that goes against God's design for sex and sexuality, such as adultery, fornication, and lust. Now, these are all things that God said you will be destroyed over. These are sins that God hates. There's plenty of them, right? Look how many has to do with sex. Over half of them. Over half the things that God hates has to do with sexuality. So we have to understand the power that the enemy plays in our sex drive, in our ideology around sex, our, our behavior around sex, because he, the enemy wants to downplay what God hates so that we get into illegal ground illegal territory so he can begin to ravish your mind and begin to um, saddle you with things that you shouldn't be saddled with. So uh, we have to understand sexual sin is something that God looks at. Now I saw this, I thought this was pretty good. We talk about LGBTQ and they say and that's a shorthand for all of these other flags that they have out there. Did you know that they had flags for everything? Um, I just thought they had a gay flag, but they got a bisexual flag, an asexual flag, a gender fluid flag, a straight ally flag. I mean, come on, a lipstick, lesbian flag. I mean, they have so many flags. So you have to really stay up with this stuff for one. Um, <laughs> um, because they're coming up with this Stuff that you, you can't keep up, up with it. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, ally, pansexual, poly, poly, polygamous, and kinky. They have this new, this term right now, it's toxic K as LBG, LB, LGBTQQIAAPQ. So, they just shorthanded it to LGBTQ, but you have to understand there's a whole string of alphabet that continues to be added to this list as the flags show you. So like polygamy has nothing to do with this? Uh, polygamous has something to do with this because now you have multiple people with multiple people and some of those people are girls with girls, guys with guys. Uh, and everything in between. That's why I guess they flip. What this movement is about is to legalize everything, to make everything okay. 
That's what puts this on the thing because people say that I can marry 15 people to be okay. That changes the natural order of what God's desire is. And so that's how come they've added themselves to this list um, because they're seeking this as uh, human rights. So if you make polygamy a human rights issue and now you're charged and you have a, a rights, a human rights violation because now they banned it in with this, it changes the law, the civil law anyway. It doesn't change God's law. So um, that's how come this bandwagon is growing with so many different allies, okay? All sexual activity outside of God's purpose in marriage to populate the earth is sin. Um, that's what we have to really realize. So... Romans 1, 21 and 25 says, even though they knew God as a and creator. So is, is that a question? Okay, so body was just coming on. Even though they knew God as a creator, they did not honor him. Um they did not honor him or give thanks for his wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasoning and silly speculation. And their foolish heart was darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became foolish and exchanged the glory and majesty and excellence of an immoral God to the image of worthless idols in the shape of mortal men and birds and four-footed uh, animals and reptiles. And you might say, what does this have to do with sex? If you read this whole chapter, which we will be getting into this section when we're talking about sexual sin, there's a lot of sexual sin that goes along with this. And the context of this sexual sin is honor. You're either going to honor God as the creator or you're going to honor the creation. And if you honor the creation, that means you're dishonoring God, okay? So that's really something you have to remember when you're talking about sexual sin. So sexual sin is not about sex. It's about lack. And I say lack of how. How, of course, is an acronym. How? It's lack of honor. So therefore, you dishonor God to honor your own thoughts, your own desires, and that becomes a stronghold. When you become the honor, the creation over the creator, you have just put yourself in a God-like position where your thoughts, your feelings, your sex drive, your, 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 it's all about you. So this is really about who are you to honor, the creator or the creation? If you're looking with your eyes, and seeing that you have a desire for something and you don't care what God says about it, you're just gonna get whatever it takes, you've now dishonored God and you're honoring your own self. So that's the H, O is obedience. It says they know God, but they choose not to listen and open up their passion of their flesh. So you know God says not to have sex before marriage, but we're not gonna listen to that because that's not normal that's okay everyone's doing and so therefore i'm going to disobey that and i'm going to do what i want and i'm going to listen to the passions of my flesh that's the o who are you going to obey are you going to obey the word or are you going to obey your flesh and if you are honoring the creation you're going to obey your flesh and that's where we are most of us that's where we sit we honor our flesh and then w is worship they prefer the idol of men, so they worship images. So people might uh, relish their bodies. They're looking at themselves all the time on social media, their electronic devices. They get into fantasy. They do all of this thing because of image. Instead of, uh, of worshiping God, they're worshiping the image. They're worshiping, that's what this scripture is saying, the uh you instead of uh, uh, honoring the majesty of God, you we've changed it to it says mortal men, birds, 
four-footed animals and reptiles. So, you know, we know we have people that have bestiality. You're having, having sex with um, animals. Um, people do all types of things with all types of things. People marry trees nowadays. The whole movement of, of, of people marrying inanimate objects. They marry themselves. All of these things are outside of God's normal plan. So sin is not about sex. It's about love. We lack honor, we lack obedience, and we lack the worship of the true and living God. And so what God said, I'm going to turn you over to your, your reprobate mind. I'm going to let you have what you want to have. And I'm showing you what I hate. And I showed you the list, those 10 things of the 20 things that he hates. 10 of those are sexuality things that I would say, all of us in the room, all of us in this, under the sound of my voice, have fallen into one of those areas multiple times, if not multiple times. And so we have to learn not to worship the creation, but worship the creator. They don't know how to be intimate with the creator, so they get intimate with creation. The problem with sexual sin is a problem of intimacy. We lack knowing what it's like to be intimate with God. We don't know what it's like to be sometimes intimate with anyone. But when we lack intimacy with the creator, that void that we have for intimacy, we begin to exercise the thing that we want with the creation. So that creation could be a person, it could be money. It could be, you know, I'll stay in the realm of sex. They are so involved with the with the human body and sex that they are putting that as far as intimacy and they're missing the whole point of what intimacy is, which has to be found in God, at least first. So I found an article very well, uh, and I have the link here. So when you get it, you can read the full article. But this is a quote. What is intimacy? It's a feeling of closeness and connection in an inter interpersonal relationship. It is essential part of intimate relationship, but it also plays an important role with family members, friends, and other acquaintances. Um, when we talk about the word intimacy, it's the innermost. It's the innermost things that we feel. The innermost feelings, the innermost thoughts, is being able to reveal things that people can't see. That intimacy. In most romance language, the words for intimate refers to person's innermost quality. Intimacy allows people to bond with each other at many levels. That's what intimacy is. And if you think about intimacy, we have spiritual intimacy, physical intimacy, intellectual intimacy, experiential intimacy and emotional intimacy. God has given us a way to attach to him in all five areas. Now, a lot of times we may only think intimacy is physical. Maybe we might think it's only emotional, but it's not. We, we have an intellectual part of intimacy. Is, our, is this person engaging my mind? Do we have similar experiences to each other? And of course, the spiritual connection. When we talk about intimacy, you have to look at all five dynamics and all five of them has to be connected or we will have a void in our area of intimacy and we will be finding these places to find intimacy in all these different places to satisfy all these five areas. And that's when we get into perversion because we begin to mix and match things and we get so confused that we don't know up and down. Because the desire of our heart is intimacy, but we don't know how to build relationships to get it. So sexual sin comes into play. So all types of intimacy. I changed them all to E words because I didn't like the way they put it. So I made up my own. Okay. So this so y'all can remember. Exper ex uh, <laughs> experiential, emotional, educational, earthly, and eternal. So those are my five areas, and I will explain those later, must be satisfied to satisfy the soul. When you think about intimacy, do you think about these five areas, or what, what do you think about when you think about intimacy? Do you just think physical, or what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on this? Or you never thought about it? Oh, well, I thought, I thought about it. 
because <laughs> you because you gave me information on it before <laughs> but i forget about some of the areas do you feel as if not wendy but ever do you feel as if when we talk about intimacy that you consciously think about these five areas or do you just think about physical or emotion only Pastor, I, you know what, you are you talking to me? I just heard like it started breaking all up. Oh, I asked in the room. Oh, gotcha. When you think about intimacy, do you think just about physical or do you think about all five of these areas? Someone in oh. the room said physical and emotional. Gotcha. Okay. What are your thoughts? Okay, no. Um, I think I have. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Des. I think I've always thought physical and emotional. I haven't really thought about the other three or known about the other three. Okay. Yeah, when we're talking about, I mean, just think about it. You think about it, but it's unconscious because when we're talking to somebody, we don't want to be around somebody who has no conversation and is an idiot. You know, that's not going to, that's not going to be someone you want to be intimate with because they can't even think straight. You don't want to be with somebody that you have no experience with. You have no, no connection. They like to ride bikes. You like to fly planes. I mean, we think about these things, but it's, a, it's not in the forefront of our mind, but all of these things play into intimacy. And that's why I said a lot of times since all of these areas need to be fulfilled, and I'll show you this in scripture so you don't think it's just all psychological mumbo jumbo. Um, all five of these areas need to be satisfied and God wants to satisfy you in all of these ways. Because if you're not satisfied in all of these ways, you will pervert what he's trying to give you and go outside of his plan and get it your way and use the creation. And so he does want total intimacy outside of physical, outside of spiritual first. He wants to touch you physically, emotionally, intellectually, every, every way possible. He wants to love on us. He wants us to feel secure. He wants to feel that, that you, you are the most important person in his life. He wants that void in you filled so that you will worship the creator instead of the creation. That's his goal. That's his love. So when we think about this sin cycle, this is what we come up with. It starts with self-will. Remember, sex, sexual sin is not about self. It's about yourself. It's about your compulsion. It's about your drive. It's about satisfying you, satisfying your will. It's, it's about you. You, 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 and even if it's in, in a form of pressure where you, at uh, one point I'll show you that some people have sex because of peer pressure. It's still about you simply because you don't, you want to fit in. And so it's still about you. So that's where the cycle starts. Death cycle always, 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 always starts with something in us. We have to realize that. And that triggers something. It triggers a compulsion. We have a compulsion to do something which feeds a stronghold, feeds a belief system that we have. And that feeds us into a trap of passion. And once we're in that trap of passion, we begin to do some spiritual things to try to get us right. But those spiritual things are done and those actions are done generally dishonor God. And since they're dishonoring God, we go right back into the cycle. So this is the sin cycle. And it says here, the root of sexual sin is pride. And that comes from, I think, Psalms 11, 2. I think I put it in here in another slide. Which results in dishonorable action. The heart and head of a man is given over to idols. So all types of sin is birth. So when we talk about sexual sin, this self-will is really a thing of pride. Can you swallow your pride can you swallow you so that you can actually see God? Will you submit to God? Will you submit your 
thoughts, your passion, your your perversion, even some su submit your perversion to God because He wants to unravel it so that it comes back into the perfect working order of God. He really wants that. And so passion, perversion, and lust are a three-part deadly cord that will kill you. Um, that's what the enemy is seeking to do. So when we think about sexual sin, self-will is your desire. Compulsion can be internal or external triggers. Your passion is your mental illness and tapes that you play in your mind and your actions. You can have spiritual discipline, which is reasoning. If you're using spiritual discipline with reasoning, what that usually do in this cycle is make you feel guilt, shame, and blame. And now you condemn yourself. In this cycle, that's how you apply spiritual things to condemn you, to say that you're a sinner, that you'll never be good, you'll never be good enough, I should have known better, da 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 you, you tell yourself the lie. And since you've told yourself the lie, you stay in this cycle. Um, and this leads to broken relationships, which keeps you re-entering into the death cycle. Does that make sense, how this cycle works? Are there any questions on it? All right. So think about sexual addiction, uh, addiction, it has a cycle too. So I put this in here to let you know that cycles have inter intertwining cycles. So it's a web of cycles. And you wonder why you can't get free? It's because you're caught in a web and you don't even know you're caught. You just think you're living. You just think it, the enemy is very strategic in getting you trapped. He wants you trapped to say, I can never get out of this. But I'm telling you, the blood still works. The guy can break every cycle. He can break every web. But you have to want it to be broken. If you don't think the things you're doing is wrong, you won't try to break it because it's okay. Everything you're doing is a good life. It's all right. Well, that's right. So this is the Proverbs scripture I told you about. When pride comes, boiling up with arrogant attitude of self-importance, then... Then comes dishonor and shame. But with the humble and the teachable who have uh, chiseled by, have been chiseled by trials who have learned to walk humbly with God, there is a wisdom and soundness of mind. So when I'm looking at this pride, boiling over with arrogance and self-importance, um, when we think about self-will, self-importance, that pride comes before that happens. And so that's how come I say pride and self-will is really the root of uh, sexual sin. It has nothing to do with sex. It has everything to do with lack. If you're walking in, pr in pride, you lack submission. If you're walking in proud pride, you lack honor of God. Okay? So this is kind of a scale. I, I looked at scriptures and I put it on a scale. And, and, and I'm not going to go over the details of this scale, but you'll see it on the next slide. We are either in a one through a four in our sex life. Faithful, family, friends, or fantasy. Every sex category that I found in the Bible falls into one of these categories. And what our mind generally does is, no matter what we're doing, we seek to put ourselves in the faithful column. Even if we're not, we rationalize our mind so that we say that what we're doing is okay with God, okay? But it's not okay with God because there's really in scripture only one thing that's right with God. So what this thing does is uh, sexual sin has a, the scale is sins, okay? We do number one because we think it's safe. We have safe sex, we have, uh, safe relationships, everything we want to be safe. Okay, that's the S. I, when you have family, um, it's incest. Now, let me tell you the truth. The only safe way to be faithful is in a marriage relationship. But what the mind tells you is you put yourself in this safe relationship because we tell ourselves that whatever we tell ourselves to make it safe, it's a host of things that we tell ourselves, but it's really not safe. Incense is with family. Uh, no one knows when you have friends. This is where the hidden stuff come in. And then self-satisfied. So that sins, S-I-N-S, which is fantasy. 
These are the four categories in the Bible and how we reason with ourselves to say that what we're doing is okay. So what, is, what does this say? It says, pride reasons or ignores the warning sign, so sexual sins rule. Sexual sin rules in the church. It rules outside of the church. You see so many people falling because of sexual sin because they don't actually understand that the web that they're in and they're treating it with a sex problem instead of looking at the root cause issues in their life and treating that root cause, okay? So, okay, so this is a table you can look at later where uh, I have here, if it's honoring to God or if it's not, okay? And these are all the scriptures that show you uh, the, the four areas of, of, um, of, of, of sin, of sex, sexuality. The only one that honors God is the first one, covenant relationships. It's a very small box. Everything else is either incestuous, sex with friends, if you have adultery or, or, or whatever, and then fantasy. These are the worlds that we live in when we're talking about sexual sin. So the question is, do we honor God in our sex life? Or has unfaithfulness perverted our view so that when we're looking at our sex life, we're looking at it from what we believe, not what God says, but what we believe. And so there, you make God's word of no effect. That's what it means to pervert or twist God's word. And many times that's what we do. We justify our sex life we justify our sin life. But the scripture's clear in what's valid and what's invalid for sexual sin and how we can get out of the, the death, death cycle. So on this one, I'm going to talk about all three of them, the triggers, strongholds, and the traps. Um, when you think about triggers, and this is an intertwining thing, another cycle, this is another cycle, Triggers. This is the measurable question that speaks to our passion. When you think about triggers, when you think about demonic strongholds, that's what you're thinking. How can you identify if you're caught in this cycle? That's what the measure is. That's what's going to trigger you to know, hey, maybe, maybe I'm being oppressed right now. Maybe, maybe something's happening right now that I need to really check. That's the measure. Strongholds is the method. This is the legal ground or the legal right the enemy has to keep you bound. Um, and this is usually perversion. This is usually twisting the truth. That's what perversion is. It twists the truth. Um, and so you start with your passion. I want this guy. And then it perverts it. Perversion is the method of, of demonic entry. He perverts the truth and says, oh, well, we'll get married, so it's okay. Okay, well, you're not married, so it's not really okay. But but perversion twisted it as if it is okay. And then the motivation of that twisting is lust. And that's the trap. That's the trap that really gets it. This is truly demonic manipulation. Simply because we won't yield ourselves to God. That's what the sex problem is. It's a matter of not yielding our whole self, including our sex drive, but mainly ourselves to God. And so therefore, sexual immorality is just, or sexual sin is just rampant in every, every society. So this is the black spot after the trap. So I'm not going to go over these, but you have, put them in two pages. Amanda says my pages were too many. It's probably still too many words. But passion is a strong and barely controllable emotion some indicators that you're under attack. So remember, this is how you know you're under attack sexually. You get flashbacks, inability to focus. You feel guilt or condemnation as it relates to a relationship or a friend. You have troubled thoughts. You justify sensuality. Uh, when you pray, you feel like it's meaningless to pray, like God is not hearing you. You don't have concentration. You have these theological arguments. It's a compulsion uh, that comes that, that makes your flesh or evil passions fire. That's what this measure is. And there's 10 more of them. 
Uh, you can read these. These are 10 actions. If you're falling into these, these are triggers. You, If you're falling into these triggers, you can now back up and understand and repent and turn that section over to God so that you can break out of this death cycle and begin to go into the life. So these are triggers. When we think about strongholds, perversion, remember, strongholds is twisting the truth of God's word. And strongholds can occur by childhood touching or playing. It can come from peer pressure. It can come from, it can come from rape or incest, molestation. It can come from habits of masturbation. Why is masturbation on this list of sexual sin? Because it perverts God's creation of, of marriage because your sex organs are supposed to please your husband and not yourself. And so masturbation becomes sin because it's self-love. It's self-pleasing. It's, it's not, in, not sharing yourself with someone and sharing that intimate most part with your loved one. That's like how masturbation or self-love is on the list of sexual sin. Um, but again, these are indicators that you're under attack. If you have these things happening, homosexual act activity, sa Satanism, you also have cult activity, ritual sexual abuse activity, witchcraft, your mental health and, and beliefs, acts of a pornography. I mean, all of these things are methods where perversion comes to twist your mind. You know, I was molested when I was young and that's how perversion got into my mind. I did a lot of things that I thought was okay because I was twisted by that activity. And when they didn't do anything about it, it made me hard. It, it messed me up for years. That was the entry point for promiscuity to enter into my life. I didn't care about anyone. I didn't care if I broke up relationships. I just, I was a rock. I just didn't care. Um, but when God changed that heart, all of that stuff, the, the twisting and the perversion, all of that changed. Um, God has the ability, no matter how you fall into these traps, into these strongholds, he has a method to break and set the captives free. And so these are the traps. If you if you if you fall into the strongholds, these are the traps that you will feel for guilt, shame, lack of intimacy. This is going to be a big one. If you have struggled in sexual sin, there's going to be a hit in your intimacy. You're not going to want to be touched. You're not going to be want to be be close because your intimacy has been broken and violated. And so it has been perverted. And so therefore, that's one of the lacks that you will have. Um, these are all areas. You have self-hatred that comes in. You won't be able to feel love. You, you might have daddy issues, mommy issues. You have a whole list of traps that comes simply because we didn't, uh, lust comes in. Lust again is having an intense desire or need for something. Uh, and these are indicators that we are struggling with lust. I put this little card here. I thought it was cute that love comes from the heart. Love comes, lust comes from the loins. And so uh, they have kind of this picture so that you can understand if a person's operating it by their loins or by their love. Uh, if they're, you know, so you can look at that yourself and then you get to tape and whatever. This again, some more indicators of actions that you will dishonor God because this activity will happen and you will stay in that death cycle, okay? So I told you, I would tell you these E words, the five types of emotional love and we'll close on that. But Colossians 3, one through four and verse 12, I put in here where I'm seeing where God's intimacy is in scripture. Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. That's experiential. That's how he wants you to experience him. To set your, your, your eyes on heaven. Set your, your eyes on something. He wants you to experience him. 
When Christ sits in the place of honor, he wants us to honor him in every way. He doesn't want the how to happen. He doesn't want us to, he wants us to honor. He wants us to obey. He wants us to worship. He wants to get us back to a place of honor instead of dishonor. He's at a place of honor at the right hand. Think, that's your education. That's your intellectual. He wants you to think on something. Think on what? Things above, okay? That's eternal. So he's right there. Not things earthly. Well, it's right there. Right there, earthly's right there. You die to this life and the real life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, your life is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. And this is verse 14. Since God chose you to be a holy person, a holy people with love, you must clothe yourself wholeheartedly with mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That sounds like emotional to me, all of those things. So God has made a way for us to experience him in an intimate way. So if you're having trouble with intimacy, first, not first, but one of the things you can do is Share some activities that you in, include God, like worship and prophecy and speaking in tongues. When we have an experiential, and you can use this naturally too, because if you have substituted earthly things or creation things in this area, you will know where the void in your intimacy is. So if you don't have an experience with God, which is addressing your communication and communion, you will have some issues. So learn how to commune with God. Learn how to talk to God in prayer. When you get that experiential experience, that's going to be one level of intimacy that you can connect with God. Emotional is pretty self-explanatory, self created through relation connection that allows us to share deep thoughts, deep feelings, and deep experience. This is not emotional. Remember, Intimacy is about being deep. When we share deeply, this is addresses safety and trust. If you cannot share your deep feelings, this is because you have trust and safety issues. You're dealing with insecurity. If you're dealing with insecurity, you're going to have trouble with intimacy. That's an area for you to work on, okay? What about education or intellect? Created through sharing thoughts and ideas despite having different points of view uh, on a topic. This addresses moral beliefs and mindsets. If your mindset is on a victim mindset, then we have to change what we know. We have to change our intellect. We were not created to be victims. We were created to be victors. If your moral mindset is totally against what God's word says, you saw the, the thing with family, uh, you know, the four barometer scale. If your morals and your belief system is in one of those categories, you need to re-educate yourself and find out what God's word says. Then you also have to agree with it. But if you're not experiencing intimacy with God, it could be intellectually, you have not come into agreement with what his word is saying. And so that deficiency in intimacy with God will thou be covered by something in creation to satisfy that need. And that's where you'll have perversion, mixing the profane with the whole. And then earthly, that's simple, it's physical, created through body closeness. This addresses loneliness and connection. So if you're in a marriage and you're feeling like you're all alone, this has to do with physical intimacy. You're not connected in a physical way. God wants us to connect physically. We can connect physically with him through dreams, through vision. Uh, it, it, it's visual. You're not touching heaven. But when you're in a dream, those dreams seem very real. <laughs> you like you're in it, right? Uh uh, you can also see the physical realm of God with people that love you, that you can see godly people and you hug that person. It's like you're hugging God. That should feel, fill that place of void and loneliness. And finally, eternal. This is spiritual. Created through faith, allowing the divine to be a center part of the relationship. 
This is uh, actually addresses your identity, your purpose, and power to establish the spiritual into the natural. So if we don't have spiritual intimacy and you don't know who you are, it's probably because you don't have that relationship with Christ so he can tell you who you are. And so therefore you find your identity again in creation instead of the creator. And there again, you have another level of perversion. So I would submit if you pray over these five areas and find out where you're deficient, if you choose to believe it, you might not believe it, you might keep your same belief system, which is fine. But if you choose to believe that you don't have intimacy with God and you're having more intimacy with your creation than the creator, I would say to find out where you're deficient. Maybe you experience God and your belief system is great. Maybe you have had an experience with God. But maybe you're some so you're stuck in your emotions because of lack of trust and safety issues. Start there. Start working on your emotional connectivity with God. And if you need help, set up a meeting and, and then we'll work through. We'll have a path and we'll kind of coach you through to get you to the place where you can understand and realize what true intimacy is. Okay. Ah. God made a way for us to have all these types of intimacy with him. So we really should uh, seek him. These are practical ways to build intimacy with God. Study the word, commit your to living, trust him, prioritize, uh, listen to God's response. These are 10 ways that you can practically use to enhance your intimacy with God. And this is my last um, acronym, modesty. How do you practically get intimate with God? Uh, modesty has to do with your behavior, manner, and appearance intended to avoid indecency. So we want to be modest in our sex sexuality, right? So meditate and grow in the word. That would be the M. Obey and honor God. Remember, sexuality is about lack, lacking honor. If you're doing something with your body, if God was in the room, would he smile at you? And if the answer is no, it's probably sin. Okay? Some of you might be modest. You don't want God looking at you while you're in there having sex with your husband. But he'd smile on you because he's telling you to be fruitful and multiply. So you should be very grateful because you're being obedient to his word. <laughs> Desire is the D. Okay? Desire Jesus and all that he has for us. This is how you get modesty. You want to desire Jesus. You don't want to satisfy the desires of your heart, your flesh. You want to desire God. Um, and then spirit and dwelling and refreshing. We, oh, I forgot to eat. Endure in times of trials and temptation. The enemy will come. Remember I said it's this web. He's going to come after you with all types of sexual activity, promiscuity and plans and blah, 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 blah. Because remember, he's tempting the outside. If you can remember, this sexual temptation is about your honor. This is about honoring God. And when you're thinking about this, don't think about, I'm going to yield to this temptation. Think about, I'm going to yield and honor God. That should help you get yourself out of the situation and thinking about falling into sin and falling into the hands of God. And so that's your way out. Is this honoring God? If it is, Go for it. If it isn't, run from it. <laughs> spirit and dwelling and refreshing, you're going to need the Holy Spirit to help you change your sex drive. I know I need the Holy Spirit to change mine. I pray, right? I've been single for a long time. <laughs> and I said, I did not want to be a hoe being single. I didn't want my kids seeing me with a whole bunch of men coming in and out of my room, a whole bunch of relationships. I didn't want my girls, my boys, I didn't want them to see that. And so I prayed and asked God, God, you're going to have to keep me because I want to be holy. I don't want to be a, a negative representation to my girls because that's just crazy. I gave them enough negative stuff to look at. I at least want to do this right. And so that refreshing and the Holy Spirit has kept me. And, I, and, I, I'm, and I'm not lonely. Trust me. My kids always think I'm lonely and they need to get out. And I'm like, I'm good. I'm just being on by myself. Mm -hmm. Peace out. Um, trust him. That's the T. 
trust them. You, you have to trust them with your sex life. You got to trust them with your relationship. You have to trust God. And then yield to the spirit and not the flesh. That's really modesty. If you practice modesty in your sex life, I can guarantee you, you will break out of the death cycle and you will enter the life cycle, which we'll talk about next week. For God brought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. First Corinthians 6 and 20. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? I see there's some things in the chat which I didn't see. Uh, are there any questions that you want to ask me now? I didn't see those chat questions. In the room, any questions? All right. So, Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for who you are and how you operate in our life. We pray as we understand our sex drive or even the lack thereof, our sexual sins, the things that we walk into that, God, you don't want us to walk into. Teach us, Father, how to not be prideful, not to be self-willed, not to walk in the things that we want to walk in, because that surely is a trigger for the death cycle. We pray right now that uh, we will learn to submit ourselves to you. And in that place of submission, Father, you will draw us in closer to you. And with that, we will honor you. And with that, we will shake the devil and beat him in his head because, Father, we get out of the death cycle and we walk in life. Father, we thank you for everything that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right.